I really appreciate you, Albert, uh, Albert sure. for uh, joining uh, me here. I, um, Alberto is a, a journalist and a designer, an associate professor and night chair in visual journalism at the School of Communication, the University of Miami, teaches infographics and data visualization, and has done many things, but has a, a, a few books, three books, right? The most recent one is How Charts Lie, Getting Smarter About Visual Information. Got it right here and read it over the last uh, five days. I really uh, enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, he also hosts, which I get to usually go to, and I usually get to see him there at the uh, VizUM at the University of Miami, sort of an annual symposium on data visualization, as well as data intersections uh, at, the, uh, at the University of Miami also. And um, well, let's get, let's get going. I wanted to ask you some questions um, sure. so that uh, we could kind of get some insight from your perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, really appreciate it here. So, why, so let's start at the basics. Like, why is data visualization something that we should care about uh, in uh, health, human services, in as evaluators? What, why is it why is it so relevant? You, you devoted well, a lot of effort and time to it, obviously. Because we are a visual species, right? I mean, uh -huh. we 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 learn by seeing and by observing, and you know, a huge percentage of our brain is devoted to processing visual information, not textual yeah. information. It's visual information. Our brain. I don't know what percentage it is, but it's a huge percentage of our brain is devoted to processing visual information. And we usually understand things better when they are explained to us not only verbally or textually, but also, also visually. The virtue of, of data visualization is that it's a tool that we usually use to understand, to basically discover or spot patterns and trends in data. So if I show to you a database, a formatted as a table, as a numerical table, and I ask you questions based on that data, right? The only questions that you will be able to answer through a table will be questions about specific values. So if I ask you, what was the, you know, the number of cases of coronavirus in this particular date? You just cross, you know, uh, row and column and you will be able to spot that value. But if I ask you, what is the trend in coronavirus? Is it going up? Is it going down? Are we spotting a seasonal pattern in the data going up and going down and so on and so forth? All those kinds of features of the data, sort of like the bird's eye view of the data, it's impossible to see on a table. You need to sort of make the data more physical, more graspable, more more approachable, more visual, right? You need to, as we say in the language of data visualization, you need to map the quantities onto objects and then vary certain properties of those objects like length, height, position, etc. That's right. what data visualization is about to spot those, spot those patterns. So visualization is useful for two different main purposes. One of them is exploration. So if you're you a researcher, a scientist, a statistician, et cetera, there's a whole branch of statistics called exploratory data analysis, which is in part, right, not, not everything, but in part is about using data visualization to spot signals in data, right? The right. founder of these, of these branch of statistics, John Tukey, in a book that he wrote in the 70s titled Exploratory Data Analysis, he suggested always visualize your data because if you don't visualize your data, you will miss interesting and potentially revealing patterns in your data. Always make it visible. Always make a graph or a map with your, or several or several graphs or maps with your data in order to spot both trends and patterns and the departures from those trends and patterns in the data, right? So visualization is useful for exploration and it's also useful for communication. Once you know what your data hides or what messages you have discovered in the or, or or the results of your of your explorations or your analysis or your experiments or whatever it is that you're doing if you want to communicate those to uh, a certain audience visualization is also a very powerful communication tool the communication part obviously very both of those very important um but the communication is this, uh, i think something that's uh, especially uh, interesting for the kind of the folks that we uh, work with and my students Mm -hmm. um, so being able to communicate findings, right, in a meaningful yep. way. Yeah, clearly and, combining text yeah. and words with visuals, maps, graphs, etc. We have a lot of evidence showing that if you present your information just textually or verbally, it would not be as interesting or engaging as if you pair that with graphs of different kinds. The anecdote that I use these days is that 
and I can I can share my screen with you now. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I have my weblog over here because I, I write about visualizations constantly, as you know. So I'm going to go to my, this is, you should see my website right now, which is the title of my first book, thefunctionalart.com. If I scroll down over here, I wrote about the, well, we have the famous Johns Hopkins University dashboard that everybody's basically consulting these days, right? But down here, um, this project over here that, that I wrote about, this is from the Washington Post. It's a simulator of the spread of a, of a virus, not necessarily coronavirus, any virus. This is, is basically an abstract model of how a virus spreads under different conditions of social distances and things, things like that. Well, right, right. this visual, this project, right? This I call it the coronavirus simulator, right? This, this is story over here that was published on Mar in, in, in mid-March. This is already the most viewed piece of content ever in the history of the Washington Post online, ever. And yeah, many of the and many of the stories that have become extremely popular in the past decade, in places such as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, etc., they are data visualizations because we like to see things made visual. It's also very understandable too. It's not a very complicated data visualization. No, it is not. It is not uh, very complicated. And it's yeah, a great these. example. Of, it's a great example of how how to sequence the information, which is one of the tricks that I teach in my workshops for professionals. Yeah. Don't show everything at once because if you do that, it will overwhelm people. Sometimes researchers they try to cram too much data into a single graphic. I say don't do that. Present information little by little, right? Step by step, step by step, step by step, little by little, and pair that with words, and then show more, and then show a little bit more, and then show a little bit more in a way that you basically take the reader by the hand and you walk them through the information. This is what this story does really, really well. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And you can manipulate some of the variables there yeah. and see what happens. So along the same lines, like, then what are, what, how would you describe, and I, I know we have a limited time here, but do you have some general principles when you're designing uh, data visualizations, like sort of like rules of thumb or principles that might be guide, guide you or that you, you find yourself repeating a lot, let's say to your students. Mm -hmm. and you're yeah. Them and you're yeah. I, I can actually I can actually show you an example. I had I, I have been giving lectures to different classes these days, so I have several slide decks over here. So let me go to this example. So one of the main mistakes that I see people make whenever facing data visualization is to work in what I like to call in autopilot. Working in autopilot means this. If I give my students or any sort of beginner, any sort of beginner, if I give a, any sort of beginner a data set in which all the data adds up to 100% and I ask that person to design a data visualization, I know that most of the time that person will design a pie chart because everything adds up to 100%. If I give that same person a data set that contains a geographic variable, countries or counties or states or whatever, and I asked that person with no further information, just design a data visualization, what data visualization would that person design? A map, right? Just because the data set has a geographic variable. That's what I mean by working on autopilot. And we should avoid that. Visualization, this is the key principle. Of, or there are two key, two key principles in data visualization. The first one is the principle of encoding. So the principle of encoding means that data visualization essentially consists of transform mapping data onto spatial properties of objects. So let me see if I can show you a slide that summarizes that, right? Um, encoding should be over here, right? So in data visualization, basically what you do is you begin with your quantities. Then you choose objects, right? And we call those objects geoms for geometric objects, rectangles, circles, lines, points, whatever. And then you change properties of those objects in relationship to the data, right? And we call those properties that change according to the data, the encodings. So for example, think about a bar graph. A bar graph is a bunch of rectangles. And then what happens, is, and the encoding is not the rectangle, that's the geom. The encoding is height or length, depending on whether the bar graph is horizontal or vertical, right? So height or length will be the encoding. The height or the length of the rectangles vary in proportion to the data that you're representing. There are other enco encodings, position, for example, line charts are created by varying the position of dots and then connecting those dots with the lines. Scatter plots use position on the x-axis and the y-axis. A area, for example, in bubble maps, like the Johns Hopkins University, bubbles change according to the data, the area. We can use angle, pie charts use angle and area, 
both the angle and the area of the segments of the pie chart are proportional to the data, so to speak, right? Now, the key thing is that this language is essential to understanding how a data visualization works. This is the main element in what we call the grammar of graphics, right? We need to, you need to understand this really, really well. And there are many books that, that cover this in depth. But anyway, this is just an introduction. So the first, is, the first essential thing is to, understanding, is to understand this grammar of graphics. But then the second thing is to sort of like educate yourself in not working in autopilot, right? So this is an example that I usually explain this okay. idea that visualization is purpose driven. Before you design anything, right? I usually tell my students, whenever you're going to design a visualization, don't switch on the computer, right? Uh, don't go to Excel or Tableau or whatever tool you use to, or R, I use the R program in the language or whatever. Don't go to that. First of all, get a piece of paper, get a pen and write down what you want to communicate, right? Just do a bullet point list of what it is that your graphic should help your reader with. And this is an example. So a while ago, I did a workshop for the European Court of Auditors, which is one of the branches of the European Union. They are based in Luxembourg. And when I, whenever I work for clients, I ask them to send me examples of their work so I can gently and kindly critique those examples and use them as examples in the class, right? So they send me this pie chart. You know? It is actually, we call this a donut chart. It's an obvious reason it has a hole in the middle, right? Sure. This, is, this is basically showing of all the migrants who arrived to Greece in 2016, where they came from. So as you can see, half came from Syria, one quarter from Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. And they asked me, do you think that this is a good graphic or a bad graphic? And I said, well, you cannot really answer that question if you don't know what the graphic is for, right? So I, I put the conversation this way, as an introduction to this idea that visualization is purpose-driven. You need, you need a, a gui sort of a guiding question that you're answering. Exactly. So I said, you know, let's put, let's, let's, let me sort of like think out loud here. If the purpose of this visualization is to show that half of the migrants came from Syria and the other half came from other countries, meaning that you want to emphasize Syria over the other countries, this visualization is fine. The only thing that I would change would be to emphasize that message even more by coloring Syria with one color and then all the other countries with another color, just a single color. The contrast. Right. To, just to create, a, exactly, to emphasize the contrast, right? So if that is the purpose, that's great. But what about if the purpose is not to show half versus half? What about if what you want to do is to be able to sort and compare these countries to each other? Then the pie chart doesn't work really well. You can think that you can compare them, but that's because you're reading the numbers. If you cannot read the figures, if you try to compare the segments to each other, right, it becomes really, really hard. You can sort of see that Syria is half. It's a little bit harder to see that Afghanistan is one quarter. And then after that, we have a lot of empirical evidence showing that angle and area are yeah. not great for accurate comparisons. Therefore, you need to use a different encoding. And then what about if another purpose, you want to show whether there's a relationship between these percentages and the proximity of the countries to Greece. In that case, you need a map. So based on these questions, you may shape your data in three different ways. And none of this is right or wrong if you don't know what the visualization is for, right? So this is the kind of language that you need to develop. And there are many, many tools that you can use. For example, there are two resources, online resources that anybody can use to guide your choices whenever you're going to design a graphic. For instance, the visual vocabulary, which is a big poster that anybody can, can download for free. This was designed by the Financial Times and it sorts different kinds of visualizations according to the purpose that they help you fulfill, right? Or the data visualization catalog. So this is the key thing about visualization. It's always purpose driven. That's a great, great resources here. We have the same thing in evaluation where you have sort of like, what is the evaluation question? Because if you start with, okay, let's do uh, interviews, let's uh, collect, mm -hmm. uh, do focus groups and do surveys, whatever, and you just kind of go all over the place. Let me, let me interrupt you in there. That, that approach, that more free form approach, let me try this, let me try that, let me visualize it this way, me, that works when visualization is used for exploration. When you're exploring the data, it is useful to encode your data in tons of different ways. You use a map, you use a scatter plot, you use a bar graph, because each one of them may reveal different patterns in the data. But when it comes to communicating your results, when you already know what you want to communicate, you need to use this approach. I want to communicate these, or, or the, in, in the way that we usually word it in visualization, what are the tasks that I want to enable? Do I want to enable comparison? Do I want to enable 
parts of a whole or seeing parts of a whole? Do I want to enable spotting geographic patterns? Those are the purposes of the visualization, which are listed, by the way, in the columns of the Financial Times poster that you have on screen right now, right? Magnitude, parts of whole, change over time, and so on and so forth. That's the purpose. According to that purpose, there are different kinds of encodings that work well or don't work that well. Awesome. Okay. But when, when in, in visualization, so when should you use uh, things like annotations to explain that, like, if you're, if you're sharing, if you're trying to illustrate, you know, illustrate some sort of finding or show some pattern, um, when should you use text, some sort of annotation to state it? A very, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, how do you use that? When do you use that? Yeah. Right. When you communicate with, when you, when you are not communicating with your peers, right? When you're communicating with a broader audience, the answer is always, <laughs> period, always, right? Annotation is essential and essential. It's actually, I have, um, I have a slide and this is actually related to a, the latest book, How Chat Slide. I have, um, I have a slide that summarizes somewhere, here it is, the different layers of the visualization, right? Mm -hmm. So the scaffolding layer is the axis, the legends, and so on and so forth, whatever supports the content. On top of that, you have the encodings, but then on top of that, you need to put the annotations. The yeah. annotations are a good intro, a good, a good title, good you know, notes here and there that put the data in context and so on and so forth. What I would recommend your students to do is, for example, to check the work of Hans Rosling when they have the chance. So probably you're familiar with Rosling, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. So recommend, recommend your students to watch some of his lectures because Rosling became the annotation layer of his graphics. He put the graphics in context, mm -hmm. not only explaining what the data mean, meant in his graphics, but also explaining how to read those graphics. So if he was showing a scatter plot, for example, he knew that many, much of the audience cannot understand scatter plots really well. So before he showed any data, he said, you know, I'm going to show you a horizontal axis. I'm going to show you a vertical axis. Each one of these dots is a country. And then if it goes in this direction, it seems a positive. It looks like a positive association. It goes in this direction. It's not, uh, uh. So he was explaining the grammar, the logic of the graphic, and then he showed the data, right? And then he explained the data, right? So that annotation layer helps you, serves different purposes. The first First one, but if you do it verbally, that's great, but you can also do it textually. And do it textually has several advantages. The first one is that it can help you avoid misunderstandings. So if there is a point that you don't want people to miss, mm -hmm. don't just visualize it, also annotate it. If there is something that people, that you, that you believe that you, afford, that you foresee that people will have trouble understanding, explain it. Don't let it go unexplained. And third of all, it can also increase the um, accessibility of the graphic because not everybody can, can see a data visualization, right? Yeah, if a visually impaired person sees your graphic, they will not be able to see your visualization. However, if you underneath the graphic or above it, you provide a written explanation of the graphic, highlighting the main points and so on and so forth, that helps people who can see the graphic understand the graphic better, but it also helps people who cannot see the graphic still get the information that the graphic provides because that text is machine readable. So the computer will read that description to them. So it serves tons of different purposes and more and more I find myself telling people, I am a visualization, I'm a data visualization designer, but don't just visualize your data, explain it, write about it, write about it. How can you tell if your data, if you're creating something and it's sort of too complicated? Like how do you know if something is too complicated or too simple, like how do you sort of balance it? Because so I've seen some data visualizations that are very, very, you know, hard to get your head around, head around right? But the complication, yet, like, it's not known, yeah. like, I don't know how you figure out if that's too much or if that's just, you know, the, the reader that, has that is that That is a function of different, um, it's a function of different variables. That depends on different variables. Uh -huh. It depends on the nature of the, of the information that you're providing. It depends also on the type of design that you're applying, and it also depends on the audience that you're talking to, right? So a graphic that may look very simple to you, just because you are an expert on that particular data, will look very complicated to an audience who don't have the same knowledge as you do. We call that the curse of knowledge, right? You know so much about these that you can interpret very complex graphics about this topic really, really well. But when you show that graphic to somebody else, 
that somebody else cannot interpret that. That's the curse of knowledge. But fortunately, it's something that you can bridge, right? It can be breached just, you know, you can do a very, you can do very unscientific tests. So you design a graphic, you want to communicate it, just show it to people before you publish it, right? Show it to friends, show it to your family, let them read the graphic and come back to them three or four minutes later and ask them, what did you learn? And have them speak about it. Don't guide that discussion. Just ask them open-ended questions such as, what did you learn from the graphic? What do you see? Just by hearing them talk about the graphic, that can sort of like help you identify what problems the graphic may have yeah. very important though related to the to the topic of complexity sometimes the first impulse of a person who is designing a graphic and notices that the graphic is too complex for search for the audience that you're intended to communicate with will be to reduce the amount of information that's dangerous because sometimes you can go a little bit too far getting rid of information the example that i usually put and you have seen this probably in some of my talks is this line chart of um a, let me see if I find it. I think that I have it here in this other slide deck. Um, this line chart of this one here. So the murder rate in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. this, the murder rate goes up in the 80s, goes on in, in, in the 90s and 2000s, and then it starts spiking up again around 2014. And it has kept increasing all right, in the past two or three years. Well, this graphic, if you don't know how to read it, if you don't know how the data looks like in the background, sort of like the distribution of the data, it can be very misleading. It can be, it can be, it can lead you, it may lead you to say the United States is becoming a more dangerous country in the past four or three or four years, just because the murder rate, national murder rate is increasing. But obviously this is just a, you know, it's a measure of central tendency. It's an average, so to speak, right? It's the average of the entirety of the country. And the problem that we are dealing with is that the distribution is very skewed. Most places in the United States, I usually explain to people, are down here. They are around the national rate or below, way below the national rate. Most mm -hmm. places in the United States are really, really safe. The challenge is that there are certain places which are extreme values. They are outliers. If you try to pl plot them on the y-axis, they will go through the roof, right? And these are the, 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 the places that sort of like skew the national rate, right? So the problem is not that the graphic is wrong. The problem is that it's an oversight simplification and you can only see beyond the simplification if you know the data really well which is not the case of most people therefore this is when the where the annotation layer comes in right you can still show this graphic but only if you warn people about these you can tell them well yes the national rate is increasing however this is an effect of these places in the united states which in the past three or four years have become so dangerous that are skewing the national Right. That's the role of the annotation layer. If you cannot visualize the distribution, obviously, I don't have data for every single place. But in that case, you can still show the graphic, but then explain that fact. That is not that the entirety of the country is becoming more. So the impulse of many people is to say, well, I have all this distribution, all these little dots. That seems to be too complicated. Let me get rid of that and just, just show the average. Right. Yeah, central tendency. Right, right. And, That's the, uh, it's very dangerous because then if the distribution, right, if the distribution is not normal or it's not, you know, very, the, the observations are not, are not clustered around the national rate, if they are, if they have a huge range, this graphic doesn't inform you. It right. misinforms you, right? So you and need it, to be careful just, with that. And there's a key finding there that's missed also, which is that there's some areas that are just much more dangerous, right? And that's yeah, exactly that's that's the that's the that's the, the important that's like information the, actually. The most more interesting thing, or just yeah, as the yeah. way that I use this graphic in How Chess Lies to explain, you know, if you want to have a meaningful conversation as to how to address murders in the United States, right? This graphic is not enough because this graphic may lead you to sort of like spread out your resources all over the country, rather yeah. than you know spending your actions in the places that really really that are really suffering, where people are really suffering. These are the places where you need to focus your attention on, right? Right. Really, really helpful. So there's a, there's a famous quote by Feynman, right? The, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool, right? Yeah. So uh, we all know that quote. Okay. What are, what are some uh, suggestions you might have for chart developers to help them be honest with themselves as they're developing? Like, what do you tell your students and the people you work with? Um, in that process so yeah. don't don't trust yourself that, <laughs> that's the first thing so this is a very important it's a very important thing that i address in the part in the last part of the book because it's a rule that i that i started applying to myself years ago which is that once you start reading about how 
you know, the faults of the human brain. Once you start learning about cognitive biases and the statistical problems and, you know, uh, how the brain misleads you, how we tend to see what we want to see and how we tend to project what we want to believe on everything that we see, the confirmation bias, motivated reasoning, all these phenomena, it, it, become, it becomes extremely easy to start identifying all these, all these things in other people, but not in yourself. And you right. need to begin with yourself, right? Before you can critique anybody else, you need to begin with your own work. And the first, the first thing that you need to do is basically, that's why we have peer review, right? It's like peer review is basically the institution, institution, institutionalization, right? Institutionalization of this principle, right? It's yeah. like, you don't trust yourself. You put your work to the eyes, in front of the eyes of a community of people who work in the same area so you can receive critique so knowledge doesn't reside on individual brains. Knowledge resides in communities of brains. And you, we need to assume that, right? We need to start assuming that and become a little bit more, a little bit more humble right? in the way that we approach uh, information and the way that we visualize information as well. So begin with, you, begin with yourself. Um, you need to basically you know, partner up with other people. So it's like when you're, whenever I, I design anything myself, I show it to you know, a group of 10, 20 friends. Whenever I write a book, I have like a list of friends that I send the book to who have expertise in different areas and knowledge, PhDs in statistics and in data science, epidemiology, say, I don't know, climate science and atmospheric sciences. I sort of like send them specific parts of my books, my writings and my visualizations to say, you know, I'm, I, 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 do, you see, do you spot a mistake? I'm, I'm explaining what am I things right. What yeah. am I missing, etc. So th that, that, that is sort of like a traditional, classical, um, and ideal journalistic practice. It should become more, much more widespread because we all have the tendency to sort of like being too hubristic and trust our own knowledge uh, too, too much. And I don't trust myself. I, I, I learned the hard way that when I rush and when I don't consult with other people carefully and take criticism openly, I tend to make tons of mistakes. And that, that really terrifies me. That really, really terrifies me. Yeah. So begin with that. Begin with that. Yeah, it's just like show it to other people. The best test to see whether a visualization is working or not is the test of people. Right? You can, I can teach you an entire semester of visualization principles, and that can take you a long way. I will teach you design. I will teach you encodings. I will teach you when to apply this type of graphic, that type of graphic. I will make you a better designer. But what you need to do yourself also, yeah, that's, this is one of the stages of any design, is to put your visualizations to the test. You can do this formally, scientifically, with focus groups and, or with actual empirical tests or experiments. But if you don't have access to those, and most designers don't have either time or resources to do it scientifically, you right. can also do it unscientifically. Just show your work to other people and don't bias them saying, you know, this graphic is about such and such. Just give them the graphic, let them read them, let them read them, and they have a conversation with them. What did you learn from this graphic? We have a similar process in survey development, uh, cognitive interviews, where you do the same kind of thing, where you're, where you're developing questions and you present yeah. them. Uh, Semi-structured like, interviews, if you want to put it in the language of research, either yeah. unstructured or semi-structured interviews, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. It's fancy words for things. Uh, so yeah. um, the, you mentioned during one of your talks, we talked about a little bit afterwards, uh, the importance of the cognitive domain of attention. And uh, you might have spoken also about meditation, perhaps, or at mm -hmm. least that's how I interpret it. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak more about that and the importance of that? I don't know if it's from the design perspective, the designer perspective, or the, I think you meant it from that perspective. So I want to hear more about that and see mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. what your thoughts were. Well, yeah. yeah, it's it's related to what I have just said, right? It's like throughout the years, I, I became, I, I started observing myself more than I was observing other people. So it's like I started sort of like looking into that, you mentioned meditation. It's like meditation is essentially, is essentially that, right? Observing how thoughts bubble up inside your brain. And you start out sort of like observing yourself forming opinions, for example, right? The, the, the traditional model of opinion uh, formation is the traditional rational model, which is completely wrong, right? The, the, the classical model of the person who gathers data, processes the data, filters the data, organizes the data, and then we extract a conclusion from that data and we form the opinion. It's, the other, it's actually the other way around. <laughs> the way that we form opinions is the other way around. We first form opinions emotionally, 
And then we seek information to support those opinions that we have just formed. So one of the exercises that I started applying myself, it's not really related to meditation per se, but you know, I read, a, I read a, an ebook by a cognitive scientist called uh, Tom Stafford. And the ebook is titled uh, For Argument's Sake. And it's available on Amazon. It collects several papers that Tom has written throughout the years about persuasion, right? About how to persuade people, how oh. to persuade the unpersuadable. How do you persuade, for example, a climate denialist that climate change is a reality, right? You will never persuade someone like that or like yourself. You need to put yourself in those shoes. You are also unpersuadable about certain issues. And I will get to that in just one minute. You will never persuade anybody just by throwing facts at them. Just because once you receive facts, if you have a very strong opinion, you will twist those facts to adapt them to your own cognitive model about that issue, right? The way to persuade a person is to open gaps. And by to open gaps, you need to have meaningful and kind conversations. Like if someone says, well, climate change is not real. The reactions to that should never be, here's some data that proves it. No, it's, it, it is, oh, that's so interesting. Why, why do you think that? Just walk me through how you reach that conclusion. When you ask people openly about that, all right, a, that people start becoming aware of their own knowledge gaps. And when they become aware of those knowledge gaps, that's when you kind of start inserting data to basically make their sort of like their, 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 their very certain uh, opinions look much less certain. Now, Tom applies these to other people when you want to persuade other people. But what I started, when I started reading the book, I said, you know, you can apply this to yourself. So for instance, examine yourself. Take, take an opinion that you feel very strongly about anything. I don't know. It, it would be great to have, um, I don't know, a minimum wage, right? A, a higher minimum wage. And you feel very strongly about that. How do you reach that conclusion, right? So what facts led you to that conclusion? You will discover that all our opinions or most our opinions are emotionally formed and you don't have reasons. You don't have good reasons for them. And when you try to reason with yourself about how you have, why you have those opinions, what you are doing is not actual reasoning. It's rationalizing. You are giving yourself, you are twisting again the evidence to fit your preconceived opinion. So the exercise is not to explain your own opinion to yourself. It's to try to explain your opinion, the reasons for your opinion to other people. And that is who disagree with you. And that's how you, I mean, it, it can be a devastating experience because you sort of like started becoming like a, like smaller in, in some sense. Like it's, it makes less, you more humble. Less confident about what you know. Like less, less confident about, about, less confident about everything. Uh, yeah, one of, one of the ideas that I had for books, who knows whether I will ever write a book about this, right? But I would like to write a book at some point about how I train myself to have no opinions or to have much fewer opinions based on all these points. I, I have opinions like everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But I learn to curb myself, to control myself a little bit more. And whenever I'm about to have an opinion or express it, uh -huh. try to observe myself how I am forming it. And then if I don't have a good foundation for that opinion, I try not to express it very openly, right? So we all have opinions, that's fine, that's, a hum and that's how the human brain works. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I be, feel super interested about these issues. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's great. So trying to be really honest with yourself and very humble, that's sort of like where you, you start and to question your own biases and kind of like take yeah. it back to like, almost and, like and, first and you, will never, you will never be able to do this 100% of the time. Yeah. I, I still express opinions, I feel very yeah. strongly about stuff. It's, it's like, but, but I, I, even though, I am much more aware about these limitations than I was, say, five or six years ago, for instance. Yes. Yeah. So that's progress, right? That's progress. right. That's maturity, progress, whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah, whatever um, you want to call it. Yeah. I, I love what you said about uh, persuasion, and it reminds me of sort of motivational interviewing, which is an approach within a therapeutic approach where you don't confront people head on with, let's say, the substance abuse or the eating problem or whatever it might be. Instead, you start to open questions or gaps and do it in a very, in a way that, that doesn't elicit defensiveness from the other exactly, person. Exactly. That's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, and it, which shuts down reason and everything else like that. Yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. So we'll wrap up here, but uh, uh, just uh, two last things and probably the last thing will be very, very short, but uh, here uh, for people who want to get uh, competent in the use of data visualization, get like a basic uh, graphicacy. Is that how you, uh, we call yeah, it? Yeah. Visual literacy, graphical literacy. literacy yes. 
Yeah, so um, what would you suggest? You had some great resources that you showed earlier. Yeah, also, yeah. Aside from taking a class with you, uh, what else? Well, I mean, I, yesterday I have LinkedIn over here, but right? I have also Twitter. Um, so I have done several uh, several MOOCs throughout the year. Okay. The, the latest one that I did is, uh, so this is Simon Rogers. Simon is SMF Rogers on Twitter. Uh -huh. So he just tweeted the link to a MOOC that we did together a year ago or so, which is an introduction to data journalism. So I know that not everybody wants to be a journalist, but one of the modules in that in that course is about data visualization. And I taught that. So if you go to the links in this in this uh, Twitter okay, thread. So I'll, I'll share those. Yeah. 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 So Perfect. that 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 leads to some, I think that is module four. Module four is an introduction to data visualization. It's basically a summary of what I teach at UM okay. in in one hour or so. It's like the very, very basics. And then it take you can take it from there. Right. So from there then they can kind of like get a sense of like what yeah. other resources other yeah, yeah 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 great and so the a good place to keep in touch with what you do is your website i guess and then also yeah my website yeah my blog which is uh, thefunctionalart.com is the title of the title of the first book then there are also great books that you can consult so i, I actually have some book recommendations uh -huh. in one of these in one of these stops let me see if i can if i can find them uh i think that i have them here so depend uh, yeah, call newsbombers. Um, uh, storytelling with, with data, for example, is a good intro to data visualization. Uh -huh. Better presentations by John Schwabish contains a section about data visualization. It's more about designing slides, but it does have a section about about data visualization. And then there are free books out there. So, for example, these two, this one, Fundamentals of Data Visualization by Klaus Wilkie. This is the draft of this book is freely available online. Uh, so just oh, wow. if you Google fundamentals of data visualization, it's a great intro and, and okay. it's all written in the R programming language, the entirety of the book. So the code for the graphics and everything is available in the book, through the book itself. You run for free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. These are free. Yeah. Free resources. Right. That's great. Okay. And then if people want to follow you in social, then it's a, a Twitter and then. Uh, yeah. At Alberto Cairo is a, or LinkedIn or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, whole, yeah. the whole thing. Okay. Great. Great, thank you so much for your time. I thank you, yeah. Hope you and your family, uh, everyone does well during this time and uh, uh, we enjoy the, the summer here as it's, uh, as it's starting. Feels like <laughs> the last couple of days, is, it, started, it feels like it's changed here in Miami. I, right? I heard that actually this is the warmest, it has been one of the warmest, if not the warmest spring um, yeah. in Miami ever. Yeah, it's, it feels like summer already. It feels yeah. like summer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much. Albert. Take care. Keep me posted. Okay. All right. Bye bye.